Hatchery fish are less robust than wild and lack adaptive traits evolved through natural selection. When multitudes of hatchery fry are released, they compete with wild stocks for food. The effect on many runs of Pacific salmon has been catastrophic. DFO's enhancement program constitutes a massive subsidy for the commercial fleet. Incredibly, it costs more to fill the sea with salmon and to keep the fishery going than the entire industry generates in revenue. Out on the ocean, the fleet scoops up the bounty from the hatcheries. Along with runs of enhanced salmon, the wall of nets traps rarer stocks as well. At the mouth of the Skeena, as many as nine out of ten steelhead trying to enter the river end up tangled in twine. Chasing millions of salmon around the ocean seems a peculiar way to harvest fish. As many as a thousand boats jostle for space to string out their enormous nets. Some openings last just a few hours, and the stampede for salmon is like a feeding frenzy. Within a couple of weeks, the fish that escaped the onslaught are making their way upriver. Compared to the commercial fleet, sport fishing on the Skeena is a relatively civilized affair. The famous runs of salmon and steelhead have sustained a thriving recreational industry for decades. In fact, when all the guides, equipment, and support services are taken into account, BC's sport fishery actually earns more than the commercial industry. Unlike the net fleet, the province's 400,000 anglers require little government subsidy and don't deplete wild stocks. Less abundant species are caught for sport, then released back into the river. Because anglers take less than 5% of the total catch, they have never been treated very seriously by the Department of Fisheries. Yet it is the sport fishing community that has sounded the alarm as steelhead populations have plummeted over the years. 1963, we moved up here. My husband, uh, Jim Walker, is a Geordie from England, and he was looking for a place, a fishing place, and um, a place that uh, wasn't too isolated. So uh, we built a cabin, and um, the fishing was, of course, absolutely, completely marvelous. People would pass through the camp, and the um, majority were U.S., people from every part of Europe, and they would just go wild about this, this river because it is beautiful, it is easy to fish, and um, it's a great place to be. Two South American visitors and a guide set out for steelhead in the Kispiox River. Thanks to the advice of the guide, each got a strike on his second cast. The first came in as only a six-pounder, not so the second. It tossed, turned, tugged and twisted, full of strange tricks. For three quarters of a mile, inch by inch, it dragged our man's line up and down, glued itself to the bottom worked him with and against the current. Sent the reel screaming until at one stage of the game there was little line left to work on. A 26-pound prince of trout after a great battle. Today, the fabled summer runs of wild skeena steelhead and coho have almost disappeared. Streams that used to sparkle with the flash of silver are now empty. Once prolific spawning beds lie undisturbed and barren. In one lifetime, an ecological wonder thousands of years in the making has been virtually extinguished. I've been gathering data for the last 30 years in the Kispiak, and I have, I have they kept records of, of fish caught, they on the reel and on the fly, and um, it just hasn't been good the last few years. And, um, the, the, the summer steel had just practically disappeared. You're, like when people asked me when to come, and I said either end of September or into October. And October, you have to take a risk on the weather, but that because that's when they often have storms and floods and all kinds of things. So um, that's that's the way it is. 
Just 15 years ago, the limit for anglers was 40 steelhead per year. Today, it is none. Through their time on the river, however, enthusiasts maintain a first-hand knowledge of how wild stocks are faring. In the six years that I've been in the Skeena region, we've seen the, uh, the steelhead abundance decline by probably in the order of 75%. In any given year, there, there's going to be a, you know, natural fluctuations in abundance brought about by uh, environmental conditions. But the problem we face here, of course, is that uh, whatever nature serves us up is, is basically cut in half by the uh, exploitation subsequent to the uh, commercial and the native in-river fisheries, primarily the commercial fishery itself. The fish which enter the river at that time are a very distinct genetic component compared with any other pot element of the population. So on Skeena, we still have that incredibly important, unmolested, wild gene pool that's, that's ours to treasure and ours to sustain. And the importance of, of wild anything in today's world, I think, is just increasing exponentially. It may well be that we've already lost a lot of our uh, stocks, our smaller, weak stocks uh, in the province already, and that process will continue. But that's part and parcel of uh, taking the full-scale harvest uh, from the most productive stocks uh, of the most productive species. So in, in some ways, it's an inevitable consequence of the way in which the whole fishery is, is conducted. The Skeena watershed is perhaps the finest salmon habitat in North America. Natives called this river Water of the Clouds. For more than 50 centuries, Indians here depended on migrating salmon and steelhead. To the carrier, Shimshian, Gitsan, and Wet'suwet'en, the fish were more than food. They were life itself. The arrival of the salmon every spring was a promise of survival. The first Chinook of the season was honored with ritual celebration. A bountiful harvest meant food for the entire year.